Jesus is speaking, and he says, When the king finally arrives, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he'll sort the people out, much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep on his right, goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Enter, you are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped to visit me. I was in prison, and you came. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to visit you? And the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of those things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Then he'll look to the goats, the ones on his left. He'll say, you worthless goats, you good for nothing. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was homeless and you gave me no bed. I was shivering and you gave me no clothes. Sick and in prison and you never visited. And then those goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or homeless or shivering or in prison and didn't help? And he'll answer them, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you fail to do one of those things to someone who is being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. Failed to do it to me. May God bless this reading to our understanding and to our hearts and to our lives. Amen. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, uh, today's the last Sunday in the church year. Uh, Next Sunday begins all over again with the first Sunday in Advent. We'll have blue altar hangings and we'll do the the four Sunday countdown to Christmas. In the first century, uh, the Christian, the common era when Jesus was born, everybody used to have to burn salt to Caesar once a year and you had to say out loud, Caesar is Lord. Caesar's titles were these. Son of God, Prince of Peace, and Savior of the World. Those were Caesar's titles. Do those sound familiar to you? <laughs> they should sound familiar because those are the very titles that the, the, of the little baby Jesus announced by the angels to the shepherds when Jesus was born. Caesar claimed those titles, Son of God, Prince of Peace, and Savior of the World, and he brought peace to the world by conquering the nations one by one. I clobber you, now we're at peace. Any nation that resisted, Caesar's troops would storm the city and <clears throat> they would be given by Caesar three day pass to do anything they wanted, raping, pillaging, and killing. The leaders of Jerusalem had heard about that bloodbath up north in Tyre and Sidon and other strongholds uh, and so they opened the gates to Jerusalem and they let They let Rome come in without any bloodbath, and they had to make some uh, compromises. And the compromises that they made um, were pretty serious. The the Sadducean uh, uh, priesthood of the temple um, was allowed to continue religious services only so long as they played ball with Rome. Very much like the churches in Germany that were allowed to function only so long as they let Hitler uh, do what he wanted with the state and with the Jews. The little boy um, who was announced by God's angels as the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, and the Savior of the world grew up. And he grew up to become a thorn in the side of both the Roman government under Pontius Pilate and the temple leadership, whom Jesus accused of being in collaboration with Rome. Jesus had, had the most amazing life. He had the most amazing teaching. He, he, right to the end, he was always for those outsiders, the ones who were overlooked, the ones who were um, least and last, you know? And it somehow uh, was fitting that when he entered Jerusalem in that last week of his life, as the king, 
as a king, he enters on a donkey with a little colt, a little nursing colt that's running alongside the donkey, and, and it doesn't look like any sort of a king that you've thought of before. Meanwhile, right across town, the, the pilot is entering uh, at the same time on his uh, uh, entourage, with his entourage, on war horses and, and with chariots and military might, and they're all coming into town, and it's Holy Week. You know, it's, it's Holy Week, and this is not, it's, it's, a, it's a tinderbox, because this is when they're celebrating that they used to be under uh, the, the um, power of Egypt, and now they, and they got set free. Now they're under the power of Rome, and Rome knows that this is a rough time. This is a tough time. It's tough to keep the people in their place. And so when Jesus, the first thing he does, he goes into the temple and he starts giving uh, lessons in the temple and the lessons are, are challenging people that it's about the least, not about the greatest. It's about the people who are looked down on as opposed to the people who are, who are the crust. Um, the Romans... The Romans, uh, finally, in that, the end of that week, the Romans took Jesus' life. Um, they thought they ended the demonstration that Jesus had begun. They thought they ended his movement by killing him. Um, they nailed him up and they said, this is what will happen to you if you continue doing what this man did. Um, it... it Power tends to want to do that. It wants to, it wants to show what happens to people who buck the power. The, a crucifixion was like a, a person being used as a sign. It was like posting that person up on the wall. Um, the, the arrests of Occupy Wall Street demonstrators are intended to stop other people from demonstrating. The shootings of Syrian anti-government demonstrators are meant to, be, to, to frighten off the would-be opponents. Most of us are old enough to remember the troops firing on the Kent State anti-war demonstration. Many of us have been attacked or jailed when standing up with Jesus. We believed with Jesus for a just cause. They thought that they had ended the Jesus movement by cutting off the head, by, by nailing up Jesus. They thought by eliminating uh, that this resistance to, to, uh, to domination and the abuse of power, the resistance would stop once and for all. But there was that Easter event. Whether it was a physical event or a spiritual event or a vision, I don't know. But whatever it was, the followers of Jesus continued to experience Jesus alive and strong and with them. I'm not talking about remembering him the way we do Abe Lincoln, John Kennedy, or Dr. King. I'm talking about the large numbers of people then and now who continue to experience Christ as a living presence, as a resource in our lives, a resource of power and influence and strength and inspiration to this very day. Jesus had come preaching not that he was a rightful king, but he came preaching that this is God's world. It's not Caesar's world. This is God's world. That God's kingdom, which everyone was awaiting God to bring in, is already here and it's already now. He understood himself as embodying and anointed to embody this realm which instead of Caesar's peace by conquest is peace by service and self-giving. Much of what Debbie was talking about this morning, much of what Daniel was talking about this morning, much of what Beverly was talking about this morning. This peace involved a dissolving of hierarchy over hi hierarchy of Jew over Gentile, of male over female, of free over slave. The religion in this new deal was based in God's 
grace. And not our sacrifices and not our achievements. It was only a matter of time before the followers of Christ had to realize that this meant no more white over yellow or red or brown or black races. No more heterosexuals over gay people, lesbians, bisexuals, or transgenders. No more free people as being more important to God than imprisoned people. No more, no more, no more. This is God's realm, God's world, God's way, not Rome's way. Not domination. Rome killed Jesus because because Caesar is Lord. But God raised Jesus because Caesar is not. By that we mean the way of Jesus in this world. The way of service and self-giving is God's way in this world. That's the way it is. And Caesar's way of taking and controlling and killing is not God's way. The amazing hymn in Philippians 2 says, you have that mind in you that Christ had in him. That instead of clinging to power, he let it go. And he was obedient even to the death on a cross. And because of that, Christ has been made Lord. Selfless obedience is God's way. Loving God with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength. Loving your neighbor as yourself. What's going on, not, it's it's the lifestyle of the king that we're supposed to have. That's the lifestyle we're supposed to be sharing. Um, And that's who we follow. Lording it over nobody. Uh, Anyone who follows me who wants to lead must be servant, says Jesus. What we've got going on right now in Washington, this inability to lead, is a bunch of elected officials thinking that their job is to win by domination. And we sent them there not to dominate us. We sent them there to be public servants and especially to serve the least. The sick with health care, the prisoners with justice, the poor with good news for a change, the unemployed with jobs, the elderly and the immigrant with hope. Living the way that Jesus lived cost him his life. It cost all the apostles their lives. John was the only one that lived to be an old man, and they banished him to an island. This path of service and standing against injustice is not for wimps. Richard Rohr reminds us that all of Jesus' rules for ministry, his tips for the road, are very interpersonal. They're based in putting people in touch with people, person to person the way the gospel was originally communicated. Person in love with person. Person respecting other person. Person forgiving another person. Person touching the person who never gets a chance to be touched. Person crying with a person because it hurts. Person hugging the person. That's where God's spirit is present. That's where we see God's spirit. The challenge, our challenge, is to preach the gospel that way. In other words, we become the gospel that helps the person to become who they are and who they want to become, not who we want them to become. In other words, we don't become the Boy Scout who helps the old lady across the street who didn't want to go across the street. Okay? (laughs) We don't force the Hindu or the Muslim who knows God through his or her own faith to accept Christianity. We don't ambush vulnerable people into a baptism. We don't help people so we can control them. We don't try to control them while we do what we do to help them improve their lot. Jesus didn't tell the 5,000 people, I'll feed you, 
but first you have to listen to my sermon or buy my book. <laughs> what Jesus asks us in the parable about the returning king is to treat everyone in the world the way we would treat Jesus if we knew it was him. The biblical ideal king was not one who lords it over everybody who lives sumptuously or who wins battles. The biblical king ideal is one who put God first and then every other person second. So that would mean being the best king is the one who by his life loves God with his whole heart and his neighbor as himself. So Jesus, instead of lording it over others, like that Pharisee who went up to pray and said, oh, I thank you, God, I'm not like other people. I thank you, I'm not like that adulterer. I thank you, I'm not like that robber and that sinner, and especially like that tax collector over there, judging and belittling people. Jesus instead keeps company with the people that others are belittling. Jesus moves down the ladder to become one with most in need. You know, what people loved about Princess Diana, what the royal family couldn't understand, is that when she was loving and helping people living with AIDS, it wasn't about charity or condescension, but about giving herself. It was about holding hands with people and shedding tears over their stories that their parents had abandoned them. The hundreds of thousands of flowers and mourners became, was became, because she became identified with her people. That is, when AIDS was tearing her subjects apart, AIDS was tearing her apart. And when you as a private citizen did something to help a person living with AIDS, she was so identified with her people that she understood that when you did it for them, you did it for her. My friend Joanne lives in a miraculous recovery from the crippling of arthritis, and she's doing so well that you'd never know that she ever had it. But she knows, and she works daily toward the cure for others. She identifies with those others. Her spirit is in and with those others who suffer. And when you walk for arthritis, or when you work for the defeating of arthritis by a cure, and when you help others with, who have arthritis, she knows that you are not just doing it for them, you are doing it for her. Leif, our acolyte, has serious heart illness, and he knows how his family struggles over all that. <coughs> Leif works at his young age to collect tab tops for the Ronald McDonald House because they get financially supported by several industries to pay for housing and food for parents and siblings of other children who have serious illnesses and surgeries. And when you bring your pop tops for them, because Leaf so identifies with them, he would say to you, you did that for me. Today we celebrate Christ the King, the reign of Christ. We say as the church, we're part of his body and he's the head. The people acclaimed him as the son of David, the, the true king, because like Diana and Joanne and Leif and Daniel and Debbie and Beverly, he identified with his people, all of them, rather than the top folks or the people in power. Jesus identified with those that had nothing to give him back. Herod's kingdom was gone in 40 years. Caesar's empire bloated up and took a couple of centuries to come to an end. And every empire since then that is dependent upon might to make right has eventually tumbled. But the way of Christ, the king who rules by loving all people and identifying with the least, with all of us in our most broken places, that has not come to an end. I'm blessed to be in a church where Christ is identified with so many of us. When we are in our addictions, those of us living with cancer, those of us living with crippling arthritis, 
those among us living with HIV AIDS, those among us who have disabilities, those among us who are undocumented, those among us who thought our lives had ended when our spouse died or left, those of us who knew our lives were over when our children were killed by accident, illness, or suicide, something happens to us when we know only that Jesus is, is not only king but someone who cares and that Jesus is with us in those times. I'm blessed to be part of a congregation that understands how Jesus travels incognito in the prisoner, in the sick, in the undocumented, in the abused, in the forgotten, and in the most despised. You know when you've done for the least of these, Jesus the King, who rules by love, says you didn't just do it for them, you did it for me. We live in a world where there's a lot of suffering. And we serve a God who cares about suffering. Some of that suffering comes from the political and economic realm when the wealth of nations has once more ended up in the hands of the few. And it's time to occupy Wall Street. Some of the suffering is from addictions and other diseases. And some of us are being called to be doctors or to be ministers to the sick or sponsors for people in recovery. Some people suffer because of where they were born. It's hard to believe in this day and age that people are still being targeted for being gay, bisexual, transgender, lesbian, black, brown, white, red, yellow, whatever. And Jesus is standing against prejudice. It's hard to believe there will be still people persecuted for their race. We are in this world, and we may not be able to do it all, but you and I can do something. And the king will say, when you did it for the least powerful and the least influential and the least able to pay back, you did it for me. You did it for me. Let's not offer any excuses this morning. As we move into our world this week, we're going to hear Christ in the world. We're going to hear him in real, live people. And he's going to be asking, do you see me? Am I invisible to you? Do you see me? Will you have compassion and say, that could be me? Will you move from compassion to love? And out of thanksgiving for Christ's life, God's life and spirit within you, and because of your own life for God, love for God, will you take action, whether political financial, or personal. When you did it for the least, amen.